morning, everybody. Uh, sorry for the late arrival, but um, life events overtook me in that I had to respond to the Francis report this morning. Um, as uh, the government seemed to think, having the same number of nurses on every medical ward will make everything tickety-boo, which is a sort of metaphor for the problem you face today, because um, trauma at one level is universal. And if we say that the majority of the young people you see have got trauma, it's not particularly helpful to you. It's like saying oh, all young people have got cancer. So, it, it, so life is about nature and degree. So if you don't hear anything else I say this morning, life is about nature and degree. Um, and what I'm going to try and do today is to talk you through not... I mean, before young people are traumatised, before young people are, are young offenders, they are for, first and foremost young people. They exist in families, however dysfunctional those families are, and they exist in communities, however resilient or dysfunctional those communities are. I think what I want you to do is to get back to your basic thinking, and what I'm going to try and do today is to focus it around trauma and abuse, but I want you to think not just of the young offender you've got in front of you, because the easiest thing for me to have done today would be to come and talk about the Bolger boys who I looked after or the current set of boys I'm looking after and the work I do in the team. But I want you to hold in mind um, a case, a family, a young person you, that you find uh, most difficult in, in all sorts of different ways. And that includes your own personal feelings and the feelings that they generate in you, which is something we tend to avoid as professionals and we're not always honest about. Um, so the way I like to think about things is around adversity and resilience. Um, and things are about nature and degree. Um, you'll hear a lot in, in mental health about post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, children who've been through wars in Somalia, children who are going through the Philippines disaster at the moment, many of them have got resilience and they won't actually have post-traumatic stress disorder, they'll have adjustment disorder. And most of the children you see have actually got adjustment disorder, which is a very specific response to a specific adversity and it lasts for about six months. And you classically see this in children who get taken into care. They get taken into care for very good reasons then things go more and more wrong and we don't realise why. Because that lift into care, even though they've come from an aversive, abusive background, is really actually quite difficult for them. So I just want you to think in whole systems. So let, let's give this a go and see where we get to. Um, and it, it's particularly good that um, Gwyneth is going to be talking about in, uh, individual cases and children who've committed very grave offences and that Hugh is going to go on and talk about traumatic brain injury. The study we did um, in Manchester in the Youth Court back in 1992, uh, I don't know whether you ever ask the kids you see um, how, many, you know, how many times you've been knocked unconscious. It's not a sort of opening question in engaging a young person, is it? But on average, we found in the youth court back in the 1990s, they'd been knocked out four times. Had they been to hospital, well, why would you? Had they told their parents, why would you? You've got your mates there. You're you know, knocked out for about 30 minutes, and then your mates stay by, and then they drag you home again. So I, I think one of the things, if you don't ask, you don't find out. So I, I think acquired brain injury is very important. So let's not forget it. Okay, let's give it a go. So I've been given some definitions of trauma, and, and they're all full of problems, all these definitions, but I think they've got common themes. An emotional wound resulting from a shocking event. What's your definition of shocking? If I'd been brought up in Kenya in the middle of the Troubles, I'd have a different definition to shocking to being brought up in Tunbridge Wells. Multiple and repeated life-threatening and or extremely frightening experiences that may cause lasting negative effects on a person, disrupting the path of healthy physical, emotional, spiritual, intellectual development. So I get asked, uh, are some of the children you see untouchables? You can't actually do anything with them. And out of about 250 juvenile homicides, I've got four untouchables. One in Wakefield Prison who went on to kill somebody else. And I'll just give you his formative experience. Dad's idea of making him a man was to uh, put a revolver to his head. Some, some, some of the chambers had bullets in, some didn't. Because he genuinely believed that would make him a man. Now, you may think that was abusive uh, behaviour by that father, but when I looked at grandfather's behaviour, it all became understandable. So the point I'm making is that you've got, you can't see the, the young person in isolation. You've got to see them across the system, generations and peer group. 
So trauma, another definition, and again, I think it's particularly complicated. You're quite right around substance abuse. What all the work of Darton showed is that most young people leaving any form of secure care, all they needed, and I put the emphasis on all when they returned into the community, was one useful thing to do a day, one relationship with an adult who wasn't abusive, and preferably don't use drugs and alcohol. Now, they're three very simple things that all the research showed, but as you know, in day-to-day -day practice, those are the most difficult things to actually deliver for those young people when they come out of prison. Anybody here from Aylesbury YOI? Okay, we're doing some, with the Institute for Mental Health in Nottingham, we're doing some work in Aylesbury YOI, which is about getting young people to sort of spot the psychopath in their midst and getting the staff to talk about those young people they found most difficult and actually come together as a collective to find solutions. So maybe if ever I get invited back, we'll, we'll talk about what we've found because I think some of the answers lie in how you deal with each other in a community and YOIs are a community like any other. So individual trauma results from an event, series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning, physical, social, emotional, spiritual well-being. In short, trauma is the sum of the event, the experience in the effect. Put differently, um, what these young people experience are cumulative risk factors, adversities, and it's cumulative risk that basically stuffs you in the end. So there we are. Um, I'm sure I could add to that list or reduce from that list, but there's a list of things. Now, I'm sure Gwyneth is, is going to talk to you about loss of loved ones. All I can say is young offenders are, are very careless at losing their relatives, and I'm going to show you the reason why. And obviously what they usually use in their teenage years, just when they're starting to try and get together, are their granddads and grandmas who couldn't raise their own children but have actually got something to offer in raising their grandchildren. And then what do these grandparents do? They're selfish enough to pop their clogs. So it is quite difficult. Okay. So a key condition that makes these events traumatic is that they can overwhelm a person's capacity to cope. So you've seen real living proof in the Philippines, a stoical, resourceful, resilient nation where gradually their, their capacity to cope has been totally overwhelmed, i.e. they're two days off starving to death or seeing their child die in front of them. And elicit intense feelings such as fear, terror, helplessness, hopelessness and despair. Uh, and I think it's the helplessness and the hopelessness, and it's how you sometimes are able, as, as um, practitioners, to prevent this helpless hopelessness tipping over into despair. Because many of the young offenders you see have got very good maladaptive coping mechanisms. And to be honest with you, I would not believe you that, that I would not believe what you say to me as a young offender. I can help you change because the effort you've got to put in to having a very good maladaptive coping mechanism that's annoying everybody else but is working to you, to trusting you as strangers to move to something that, that they can believe in without being laid bare is very difficult. And that is the difficulty about um, saying, well, do you upset? You, you never know when you're upsetting young people. Well, you never know that anyway, but sometimes you have to take a chance, and sometimes they're better at dealing with it. So not all traumatic events generate lasting damage, and the impact of traumatic events is partly dependent on previous experience of trauma, mental and emotional strengths, resilience, and what kind of support you have. It's particularly de dependent on when the trauma occurred. So you have to see your young people through a developmental lens. So, you know, I, I, could, I could have a competition between two young offenders who've got the worst terribly rancid life, yeah? But the difference is who experienced what, when. That's the bit that makes the difference. And there are critical points in development where it's really not too good. And, of course, then you've got anomalies like people with autism. So you've got a family. Well, why didn't he get affected by this? Well autism for him was a protective factor because he didn't realise all this that was going on was inappropriate. So you have to remember how things read across. Okay. So um, the last few years have been heavily about neuroscience. And um, Hugh will tell me if I'm wrong, but the rate it's going, it's a bit like getting an aeroplane from Manchester to London. And nobody in their right mind would travel from Manchester to London by aeroplane. I'll tell you why in a minute. 
So the brain has plasticity up until the late 30s and possibly beyond. And it may be we've got plasticity, I, room to change in our brain up to the age of 40. So if you think about it, it's a bit like getting on an aeroplane from Manchester to London. You spend all your time going up. You spend about two seconds while you can down a cup of hurried coffee. That's your therapy before you either hover around Heathrow or start this long descent. So the brain was considered to be a very rigid thing. If it was damaged, that was it. It hasn't got enough capacity to repair as other parts of the body, but it can be changed. And it is this thing around families and nature and nurture. And really, if you hold in mind one thing, most things when you talk about young people come back to Bowlby. Change continues throughout the life cycle, but changes for better or worse are always possible. It is continuing potential for change that means that at no time is a person invulnerable to every possible adversity, and at no time is a person impermeable to favourable influence. So on your darkest day as a practitioner, we'd just put, stick that on the wall and read it to yourself. Because sometimes I know it gets very, very difficult. You just don't know what step to take next because everything you're doing seems to be going pear-shaped with this young person. So, so what? Why does it matter? So, uh, all the drawings, um, I work with a lovely person at the college who spends all the time going around the elephant and castle in the subways taking photographs that young people have kindly put there for her to benefit from. So, here are some of the images. I feel like this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and go through the domains of any person's life that can affect how they then behave and what they're like and the impact of trauma. And in our field, in young offenders, we've been rather obsessed with this rather simple-minded mantra, which I have to say has come from the States, that bad behaviour begets bad behaviour. Well, I think that's fairly obvious, but it's not particularly helpful, is it? Because it's so obvious we don't really know what to do about it. So the bit that you might be more interested in, behaviour and psychopathology, is going to come at the end of this list. So I'm going to look at people across the lifespan. I've put the evidence together. I'm going to say to you what the impact is of trauma and maltreatment on children, adolescents and adults, because I don't want you just to think of the offender, because by and large, whether you want them to be connected with their family or reconnected with their family, young offenders still have connections with family. And I'm going to look at the physical impact, the effective, the relationships, including attachment, socialisation, Personal and self-system, which is what Hugh's going to talk about in theory of mind. Cognitive, which is where schools come in and should play their part, if only we could get them to. And behaviour and psychopathology. So I've now probably insulted half the audience, but I will attempt to insult all of you by the time I finish. Um, okay. So the physical domain. So what happens if you have a severe trauma in early life? Uh, and I say this not lightly, and you're a child. Well... There are some people you never see because they're dead. Okay, so bear that in mind that some children, young children, have had such severe problems they don't survive. There's direct injury and then there's lifelong disability. Uh, now, don't worry about the technical bit because I don't understand it either, but Hugh will explain it. But what we do know uh, is the physical impact of trauma on the brain. Um, affects the uh, hypothalamic pituitary access. So this is where all the sort of hormonal things are going on in the brain. And we know where it has the biggest effect is with neglect. Now, whilst child sexual abuse has become very sexy, we tend to forget plain commoner garden, brick house privy, I come from Salford, bashing a child against a brick wall and dog kennel rearing. Okay, and those are things that some of, some of the more grey-haired in the audience are busy nodding about, but the younger ones will say that doesn't happen. Well, of course we know it does, but it happens in a more slightly sophisticated way with baby P. And I think we tend to sort of forget the impact of straightforward physical assaults and neglects, particularly on boys. It affects their brain, their pituitary volume increases, it brings about endocrine changes, it makes some of their receptors more sensitive, it means that particularly you'll get an earlier menarche, you'll get growth reduction, and these children are very prone to infections. This is good old-fashioned medicine, but it adds to the accumulation of difficulties you, you, you experience when you meet them. Okay, so what does it do to the adolescents? Well, this is what you'd guess, isn't it? I don't, you don't need me to tell you this. The evidence shows that, that physical assaults mean there's increased risk-taking behaviour, early sexual partners, pregnancy before 19, and drug or alcohol uh, uh, use. 
And what effect does it have on the adult brain? Well, this is where it's interesting, because start to think of some of the families that these children come from that you deal with. Increased ischemic heart disease, increased rates of cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We don't know what the mechanism is here. I'd guess that the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is because they smoke a lot more. Irritable bowel syndrome, arthritis, fibromyalgia, peptic ulcer, diabetes, autoimmune, chronic pelvic pain if it's sexual abuse, dyspneuria, thyroid disorder and stroke. And you're saying, so what? The so what is that quite often the families of these children are the typical archetypal seen as the Department of Work and Pensions, incapacity, benefit, lazy gets, get back to work. I'm showing you some of the reasons if they've been physically assaulted as children, as adults, they are sicker adults. And it partly explains why these parents struggle in the totality of bringing up children. So I'm trying to get you to think differently. I'm trying to get you to think about whole systems because young people and nobody exists in a vacuum unless you're on a desert island or I'm a celebrity. Please get me out of here. Okay, the effective domain. Okay, so this you'll feel is closer to home. This is getting feely touchy. Okay, but don't forget the physical assaults. Effective domain is for children, the effect of trauma, emotional disorders, Depression. Don't forget depression in young offenders. Um, it used to be called hostile depression. Some people just think that young offenders are being stroppy. They are depressed. Look at joyriders. Some of them, this is a deliberate attempt to kill themselves. This is not joyriding with their peers. Aggression, decreased, decreased emotional regulation. Well, that's not going to be too good for you being able to control their behavior. Anger and fear. This is this business that, that sometimes... The anger and the fear, keep, they want to avoid, they keep their maladaptive mechanisms, which means that they're hurting other people, because if they don't, anger and fear, they won't cope. PTSD, again, again, look at this, it's neglect again, neglect, okay? It's paucity of positive affect and decreased empathy. And those are the two things that worry you most with, with treatment programs, what works in reducing recidivism for young offenders, what you're really bothered about is what works in reducing sadistic violence in young offenders, because that doesn't go down too well if you have one of those on your list who go on to do something really nasty. And here we are, that the impact of neglect is a paucity of positive affect and decreased empathy. And at the end, if I've got time, I'm going to uh, share with you some of the new thinking on personality disorder, because many of the young people you're seeing as they're returning from custody to community are beginning to get labels they've got a personality disorder. And I want to deconstruct some of the myths about personality disorder. And they have hyperactivity and lack of self-control. So if you've got a child in mind now, or an adolescent, just think, if it's an adolescent, did they have these things when they were children? It helps you build up an understanding. And, of course, other agencies should have understood this better, because if they had, you wouldn't have them as young defenders, and that's the problem. Actually, in adolescence, it's really straightforward. Um, so the impact it has on adolescents on emotional and feelings is depression, you know, we, 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 we stand up and we say it's dreadful. Another child's hung themselves in custody because prisons are such dreadful places. But these children have a predisposition as well. Panic disorder. Now, imagine being a big sort of strapping, I'm top of the peer group, I'm, I'm numero uno, and being subject as an adolescent young offender, top of the peer group, leading the gang, and they suffer panic disorders. That's not too good for their image, is it? So they really have to react in a maladaptive way to that. And some do have PTSD. Oh, what about the adults? What about these parents of these young adults you're dealing with? Well, what do they get? Well, they get really stuffed. They get depression and anxiety disorders. Depression and anxiety disorders are not very good things to have when you're trying to parent a teenager because depression and anxiety disorders will mean you are completely absorbed with your own difficulties and can't jump out of that to do what you should be doing for your teenage children who are young offenders. So spare a thought for the grown-ups again. Relationships. Okay, so what will trauma mean for relationships? It will be no surprise to you that this is where we get to you who literature, i.e. attachment. 
But it, it, it's no use. It, it's no use. You, if you're lucky enough to sort of beat the long waiting list to see a CAM specialist, but we are getting better, I promise you. It's no, it's no use the CAM specialist telling you that, that this adolescent or this child's got attachment difficulties. You need to know what sort of attachment difficulties, because the intervention for each is different. Um, uh, so I, I, I think the two that stand out with, with young offenders are insecure attachment and disorganised attachment. Insecure attachment is definitely linked to those who become sadistic later on. And disorganised attachment is, is linked to what you'd expect. They're all over the place. They're multiple offenders. And some of that offending may almost by accident be very serious. So you need to think about whether, as a child, this young person you're dealing with has had an attachment disorder. So here you are. So here you are with relationships. So what happens in adolescence? They develop maladaptive working models, i.e. the pain in the neck to you about getting them out of gangs, getting them to have better ways of dealing with things. They've had the CBT model. They've done the What Worth, Worth It's program. They've had all the programs. And somehow it's still not working. So all you have to remember for that young person is that they cling to those maladaptive working models like you would cling to your life raft. Uh, if you just were lucky enough to get one if you'd just gone down on the Titanic. So you have to say to them, I've got a life belt that's safe. And you have to get them to believe that. And to do that, it, it, it isn't there in any working treatment program that you'll find. It is in the relationship building. Violence in romantic relationships, I think, has been very underrated and undernoted. We're getting to know a lot, lot more about early dating violence, e e even in children as young where sexuality isn't a component of the dating relationship. Uh, and it's slightly assumed that this is boys in early dating violence towards girls, but we now know the girls are just as good at it as the boys. So it's a two-way street. And victimisation in romantic relationships. And in fact, the same young person can be both the perpetrator in one relationship and, and the victim in another. So this thing sort of turns round. So don't always think that because a young person's had one role in a violent relationship, that that relationship will be, be the same in another relationship. Sometimes they swap roles. And it's just about having lateral thinking when, when you're working with young people. And in adults, well, what does it do? Well, guess what? So if you've got relationships difficulties through trauma in childhood, dissatisfaction and disruption in relationships, well, that's not too good for a growing adolescent, is it, if that's what your parents are like? Insecure attachment with children, well, that is the kiss of death for the child. And intimate partner violence, so, so it means that, that these adolescents have often witnessed a lot of intimate partner violence. And we all know that by and large, the mother tries to get the kids out of the way, and in some ways that's probably the worst thing she can do because hearing domestic intimate partner violence probably has a far worse effect on the brain than seeing it because when you can't see it, you can imagine it's even worse than it actually is. So, so you have to sort of think about these things in a very lateral way, and I hope as I'm talking, you're thinking about young people that you're privileged to be looking after. Socialisation, including peer relationships. So what in fact impact will a trauma have early on on socialisation? Well, again, I want you to see here that it's neglect that comes out very strongly. Uh, and, and, you know, is it a surprise that if you suffer just straightforward neglect, which is a form of trauma, you will be very withdrawn? And that's not good for the rest of your development. Poor social interactions, if you've experienced neglect or physical assault, Aggression goes with neglect and social information processing deficit. So i.e. this tends to go later on with hostile attributions, the thing that's the bread and butter of what you have to deal with working with young offenders. Socialisation as an adolescent, actually um, the only real evidence where, where trauma is impacted on relationships is social withdrawal. Uh, and, it's, it, and this is quite difficult because actually in probably not you working with young offenders, but other agencies trying to help this adolescent come out of their social withdrawal, unless they understand why it's come about, there is a, there is a chance that will actually tip them over into going into bad behaviour. They join a peer group and then they start behaving badly. Now, I'm not saying social withdrawal is good, but you have to be careful to understand what you're tinkering with. And at the moment, um, I, I don't, I'm not saying that um, having trauma in early life 
is having no impact on adults and their socialization. All I'm saying to you is that sometimes the evidence base isn't strong enough. So there's nothing that reached statistical significance. I'm sure somebody will put some in that, something in that box very quickly, but we're not there yet. OK, what about theory of mind? So this is where it's all at at the moment, mentalization. Personal self-system domain of a child. So what impact will trauma have on the child? Well, delayed theory of mind. Dissociation. How many, how many of you have sat in a room with a young offender and thought, I'm not sure what's going on here, and wondered whether actually they are dissociating in front of you? Has that happened to anyone? It's really, really hard to know. Uh, it, it, the, the most poignant recent example I've had was with parents of a set of brothers I'm looking after um, in, in the north at the moment. And it was when we interviewed mother, and we knew we knew that she'd she'd been the victim of intimate partner violence because there were enough social services notes about it. Um, and so we're always wary. But in in the middle of this interview, she just completely dissociated. It made me feel awful because it's a horrible thing to happen to somebody, and I tried to avoid it. But it is something to look out for. Personal self system change, particularly where the trauma has been child sexual abuse. These children hold shame with them. And shame's a very powerful enemy of normal development. The other thing you see in children, and why am I talking to you this when you're predominantly working with adolescents? Because you enter families' houses. And when you enter families' houses, you have the privilege of seeing whole families. You see the rest of the children. Uh, and, and it's very telling when you see a child who's got no concept or very little concept of symbolic play, one thing representing another. Impaired self-recognition and impoverished internal language, these are very damning things to have as a child. And they then hook over into adolescence. In an adolescence, again, no, no surprises here. What does this mean? Reduced self-esteem. Impaired perceived competence. So you're busy saying you're doing really well, you're doing great, you're doing great. And they don't believe you. And actually, you're making them angry when you say that to them because they really don't believe this. You have to have another way of explaining to them they're doing well because otherwise they'll re reward everything you're doing and you saying they're doing well by saying, well, I'm going to do the opposite now. And you must have come across them doing that. Child sexual abuse still leads to continuing shame, recklessness and risk-taking behavior, self-harm, and of course, the business you're in, you give them an external locus of control, but you want them to develop an internal locus of control. And if they've had this difficulty in this domain, personal self-system, because of trauma, they will find this really difficult. And that perhaps will explain to some of you why you find it difficult working with some children and some adolescents. What does it do to adults? Pregnancy under 19 and deliberate self-harm. OK, let's move on rapidly because I want to get on to the personality disorder. And if I keep going, I will. So, child, trauma, language delay, educational delay, cognitive delay. You're destined to be school excluded, to become a NEEP, and to finally get your education in prison. And if you're really lucky, you'll get on a Timpson scheme and you'll end up working in a shoe shop and you will be rescued. But not everybody can be rescued by shoe shops. Adolescence, educational dropout, educational underachievement. OK. We've just got the findings from the OECD study about um, what's happening in the Department of Work and Pensions. And one of the most telling findings, it's not out yet, is, is the adverse impact in the UK over other European countries of having children out of school at 15, destined for unemployment. So, Mr Goves, if you're listening, let's do something. Uh, in adulthood, unless you're you know, rescued by Timpsons, illiteracy and reduced employment opportunities. And there you see a generation of cycles that I see in North Manchester of communities that are traumatised, that are traumatising, are in third generation unemployment. They don't know work. They don't recognise it. OK, what I want to do um, now is look at the obvious bit, which is the bit behaviour and psychopathology. And so for the child, if they have trauma, guess what? makes them more likely to get aggression, conduct disorder, ADHD, and oppositional defiant disorder. No surprises there. And in adolescence, no surprises. But I want you to hear what I've said before then. Then you've got more mechanisms to help this bit that is your core business. 
So in adolescence, antisocial behaviour, conduct disorder, substance misuse, school exclusion, aggression, bullying and depression, what this whole day is about in the impact of trauma. Adults, not too good. Substance abuse, personality disorder, eating disorder, often forgotten, major affective disorder, so mood swings up and down, sleep disorder and PTSD. So it makes them not healthy parents. Okay, so what I want to spend the last few minutes in is something I've not been asked to do, but when, when I looked at what you're all doing, I thought it might be helpful. So I want to look at recent advances in conceptualization of emerging personality disorder, um, because um, I feel quite children who should never be given this label at all because of their age, but shouldn't have the label anyway, get this label of personality disorder, and you might as well just put them in the dump box because of the label. So I want to try and unpack a few myths about this. So uh, most of the work on this has been done in the States, and it was bad behaviour begets bad behaviour. Oh, let's have a psychopathy checklist. And all a psychopathy checklist is says that bad behaviour may lead to bad behaviour. It's not tailored to gender. It's not tailored to ethnicity. And there have been some brave clinical psychologists in Scotland in the UK who have been fighting this concept and saying, actually, the more we learn about personality disorder, it is not, as it says, it's not set in stone. Bowlby was right. It is permeable to favourable influence. So the work we've been looking at is a comprehensive assessment of psychopathic personality. It also applies to borderline. And, we've, and there's an assessment tool being developed by David Cook and Caroline Logan at our trust. And um, again, quite a few of the girls you see as they enter their late teens will probably have borderline personality disorder, and the boys can even have it, but it's usually not recognised. And what we've done is, is actually look at the construct of psychopathy. And psychopathy is, is actually a dynamic phenomenon and therefore open to positive and adverse influence. It's not the, the diagnosis of death. And I just want to go through in the last few minutes some of the domains where, we, we, where this assessment tool has been developed. And we're piloting it at the moment in, in, with our um, uh, young people in, in our service, in our Friends at Adolescent Community Team service. And the really nice thing about it, I've got a nice young, I, I, because I'm at times preoccupied with being present at the moment, my clinical work is just seeing lifers, and it's such a privilege to see young people who are serving long sentences. I see them once a week. Um, I'm usually better than the maths lesson, so I don't get any do not attends, which makes me look very high scoring on my performance in the trust. So I'm doing well there, so that's good. Um, otherwise, I'd be constantly on discipli disciplinaries for not obeying rules. Um, but the domains, when I started using this with young people, it, it was like they'd looked at me and they'd think, well, I've been seeing this silly old cow for months and I don't know what it's all about, but there we go. And they said, wow, you understand me. So it was a language that tapped in to the elements of their personality that were messing them up. So attachment. So let's look at it quickly. Attachment styles and being uncommitted. Okay, you might guess that. Looking at behavioural. Um, so they lack perseverance. They lack conscientiousness. They certainly um, are not altogether there on trustworthiness, are they? They're opportunistic, but in a bad way, not in a good way. They can be restless, disruptive, disobedient, unmanageable, and aggressive. These are constructs of personality development and psychopathic personality disorder. Let's look at the cognitive. Now here, I think this is interesting because you will see there many similarities you see in lots of young offenders where they have hostile attributions. So you'll see that, that you're working with young offenders who are suspicious or hypervigilant. I'm not suggesting where this comes from in personality disorder, but you can sort of guess where I might be coming from. I might be coming from trauma, but we haven't got the evidence yet. But you can see how these things start to connect up and make some sort of sense. Intolerance, inflexible and stubbornness. Now, the certain thing you can say about working with young people with emerging personality disorder, they certainly have the big S. Okay. Self, now you know this, it, you know, you think self-centeredness, self-absorption, self-aggrandizement. 
But at the same time, they can also have a sense of vulnerability whilst have a sense of being special. So it's these odd mixtures of things that don't fit together that make them such a sort of strange puzzle to sort of unravel and, and help them put back together in a way that makes them tolerable to society and themselves. Emotional, well, of course, you might see it's what you'd expect here, isn't it? And you could certainly sort of guess that trauma early on might have possibly had a bit of an influence on this. So, yes, they may have been born with slightly different brains, but nurture and, and impact of events has had a heavy effect. Lack anxiety, lack pleasure, lack emotional depth, lack emotional stability and lack remorse. Not a good starting point if you want to reduce their risk of reoffending, is it? That is th so this one is the real one. Now, when we looked at the psychopathy checklist, none of this was really iterated in a way that was positive. It was all negative. So your task is to tackle each of these and see what you can do about it. Dominance, the sense of dominance, this particularly ap uh, applies to those with um, have sadistic habits. Antagonistic, domineering, deceptive, manipulative, insincere, superficial and garrulous. Almost sounds like their school report when they were four, doesn't it? Okay. So what I wanted to do was to give you some sort of um, way of thinking about the impact that trauma might have but, but on the stages of life, how it plays out through the developmental stage of life, and how when you see a young person, who, who, who you really think, what on earth am I going to be doing here? I don't know whether to tread there or make him worse, or if I do that, what will happen? It's always better to think in whole systems, because you know, unless they're physically actually in the seg at that moment in time, they are not totally socially isolated. Uh, and I just like this one. Um, we, we had to work very hard to find the be happy one, but there you are. So um, anything else um, you, you want to know or anything I can explain or anything else we can be doing? There are two things we will be doing. Um, Hugh has um, noted that uh, in his presentation that um, the team um, in Manchester led by Dr. Chip Sabeason has been delivering the chat this is an integrated mental health screener and assessment tool for all young offenders. It will be rolled out in, in all the young offender institutions and in the youth offending teams. We're piloting the youth offending teams at the moment. It is holistic and it will give you a set of information that can pass to one part of the system to the other without having to ask all the questions again. But as we develop this, we, we had a bit of a thought, and I've got one minute, so I'll use it. And that was... Um, Really, I, I do feel I need to tackle Mr. Goves um, because he, he quite rightly wants children to achieve. I want children to achieve. That, that is a great thing to happen. Um, the last government uh, spread well-being dust over schools, so there's a lot of well-being in, in schools. Um, but, but people like nurture groups and place to be go to the heart of the matter and are looking at resilience. But one of the things I think is missing is we don't know the true prevalence rate of mental disorders in primary school children. So um, against the odds, I've got ethical approval, I've got a set of academies in primary schools, and we're going to do a point prevalence study of the rates of mental disorders in primary school children because we believe we've got so much untreated um, disorder there, whether it's ADHD, whether it's tics, whether it's mixed developmental disorders. And as you get so much better at reducing the child uh, prison population, the group you're going to be left with are these groups who've not been identified at school, who've got real disorders and who deserve treatment, which I think will only be delivered by putting child guidance back into the playground so that they can be seen without feeling being labelled or stigmatised and we can offer treatment. And I think if we can do that, I think we can help at, at, at the end where I work and you work, that we will end up with f even fewer people, young people needing to go into prison. Um, so, um, thank you for listening. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sue. Uh, and uh, while you uh, catch your breath, uh, I know you will all have your reflections on what's been presented this morning. Uh, I've got mine. Uh, first, we heard from Mark Liddle, who gave an overview of the research. Uh, and what can and cannot be gleaned from it. The stark fact is that most people in uh, youth, most young people in custody have suffered trauma, uh, and he made the distinction between interpersonal trauma and other types of trauma. 
This is what people are doing to children and young people from birth onwards. Going forward, Mark said that we want to hear from practitioners and he coined a new phrase, uh, becoming trauma informed. And I guess that's what today is all about, and especially this afternoon's session. From Sue Bailey, uh, well, Sue made a, a plea for us to get back to basics and to reflect on young people that we are working with currently. Uh, she talked of not seeing young people in, isolate, in isolation and being very aware of the context of their generations and also their overall circumstances. Sue presented us with some very big words, fear, terror, hopelessness, helplessness and despair. She took us through the whole plethora of problems that can be associated with childhood trauma in later life. But on the positive side, with a nature nurture slide, she talked about the fact that everybody does have the capacity to change. What chimed with me was the fact that whatever else you do with young people in programmes, we need to work very hard to build relationships. We want to hear from you in terms of your observations and your questions. We'll take questions in threes. Who would like to go first? That table over there. The absorption um, could, could you start that again? Yep, sure. I, it's for Sue, could you just speak a bit more about the, the self, the, the self-centeredness, self-absorption, etc. Just elaborate a bit more on why it develops, because it's something I absolutely recognise. But just, I, I don't always find it easy to explain to other people. If you could just give us some top tips. And before you do that, Sue, if we can just take a, a couple more questions. And again, a question for Sue. Um, why isn't this information available in the courts, or is it available in the courts? I employ young people, recognise everything Sue is saying, and beat my head against the wall with professionals who just tell me they're bad kids. So if there's anything we can do to spread that word, it's absolutely amazing. And one more question. Um, I'm really interested in finding out um, the length of time that you can expect to work with a young person to make some positive change in their behaviour because I guess most of our projects have a very short time to work with people. Um, so how we can make that most effective. So questions there about duration of intervention, self-absorption and what more can be done to inform practice. Do you want to start, Sue? Okay. I think that the, the sense of self and self-centeredness is, is a whole sort of session and I th hope Hugh will address some of this this afternoon. But, but I, I, think, I think the thing is it's not obvious when you're not making progress with somebody. Um, one of the things I do is I, I, get, I get young people to go through their routines in a week and what they do and we learn all sorts of things that we'd rather they weren't doing. And there are large gaps of time when you're not quite sure what they're doing and actually what they're doing is thinking. Uh, and, and they're not renowned for their thinking usually. We think they don't think, but they spend a lot of time thinking. And it, if you then start to ask them about the sorts of things they're doing, either through their music or their drawings or just sitting vaguely in space, I think you will start to get some ideas about their sense of self and self-centeredness and sometimes where they, what they are doing. And it's quite, I think that personally, I, I, I always do that as a pen and paper session. So there's nothing structured about it. They get a bit fidgety. They'll either tell me to F off or they'll, they'll be in a mood where they're concentrating and they'll do it. So that's, that's how I'd set about it. Professionals, um, schools, how do you get people more on board? Um, I think it's easy to blame other professionals for not listening and not understanding, but I think I think it's a bit like you have to put it in their language. So I just think if we converted everything we know we need to be doing, teachers to be doing in schools, into I will guarantee you you'll get X better set of results. So I think part of it's our our fault we don't put it into their language. Uh, and it's just easier for them to say that, that these young people are a problem, just, you know, send them off, get rid of them, don't do. Um, but I think part of the responsibility is with us to reframe. Um, what do you do about not having the time and be able to work with people? I mean, that's why it's such a privilege at the moment just to be working with, with young people over a period of two or three years and you learn such a lot. I think you need to, I think this is about supervision. 
I think you need to ask whoever supervises you, what is it, what is, or, or ask the multi-agent system, what is the 5% change that would make this young person tolerable to themselves and tolerable to others? And it isn't always about the amount of offending they're doing. So I, I think I'd concentrate if you've got limited time and, and actually negotiate with them. What is the 5% change they want to bring about? Ask that question of everybody in the system, and you usually find that there is some resonance across it. Yes, we don't want them raping somebody again, but what are the other things that everybody would agree would make this easier if you don't have the luxury of time? And the other one is if you pass them from one service to another and transition over. Um, if you look at the work of Frank Richards in the States, what he's saying, a bit like when you've been working with abused families, you need, you need somebody who's a point of contact. So they still need to be able to phone somebody every two months. And that person, that, it's often what the Prince's Trust volunteers end up doing for 10 years. Just the fact that they can ring somebody every couple of months, even if it's say, F off, you're an old tosser, but however, I just want to have a rant at you. Thanks very much. I feel better. Put the phone down. Time for more questions. Who wants to ask a question or make a comment? Right. Yeah. So you talked about uh, the internal working model of the adolescents. What about um, the ones of the workers supporting the young person? I didn't get that. We, we didn't quite hear that. Could you just repeat it again, please? Yeah, so you talked about the maladaptive uh, internal working models of the adolescents. What about the internal working models of the, of the ones supporting the young person? Do we have to look at those? So the, the maladaptive working patterns of, of those who are working with and supporting young people, do we need to address those? So I think that was the question. And, and is there an, there's one at the back. Anybody who's uh, done any work on looking at the aggregated results of assessment on the asset framework may well be aware that physical health is the Cinderella domain. Um, and in particular, Sue, I'd like to su suggest how can more information on physical health be gained? The work that I've seen done on aggregate assets, aggregating the results of assets, th is that there it's under 30% appropriate completion to those kind of questions. Given the significance that you were saying that, uh, 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 that there could be indications of trauma in this. And one last question. Okay, Sue. The maladaptive working patterns okay. All right. and I, physical health. Okay. The maladaptive is really difficult. Uh, um, if um, uh, Mary McMurrin and Eddie Kane at the National Institute for Mental Health in Nottingham have done some work in Aylesbury YOI, because Aylesbury were having, like many YOIs, having a lot of problems with, with levels of violence. And it's been quite interesting because this was a qualitative study working with the staff and working with all the young people. And um, it has actually teased out some of the things that staff do that are not helpful. Um, I think this is an issue of supervision, and I think it is quite difficult. I did two studies back in the, well, the beginning of, of this century about looking at attitudes of staff towards young people when they had to look after them in difficult circumstances. And, and if you want to guess the emotions that came out, um, it, it was despair, anger, hatred, but not being able to say to a supervisor, I actually hate that kid. I actually feel like twatting that kid because they're causing me such grief. And it's very difficult to have that conversation in the current climate of targets and the way services are run. But I think it is about um, supporting staff to actually talk about how these children make them feel. Uh, to, that staff come from um, homes where they've got their own difficulties, where if we believe it, 30% of staff working in any institution will be going home to abusive, domestically violent homes. And it is about being able to actually get staff able to talk about those feelings. And I think when they do that, then they're less likely to be maladaptive in the way they treat the young people. But that's a big ask, and that's down to organisations and leaders. Um, and, you know, that's very typical to topical today in Francis. Physical health, um, I only smile because I'm 
actually living in the hope that if all of you will do the chat and not moan about it not being perfect, which it isn't, um, we will get far more information about children's physical health. And the answer is, which I think will be agreed, and, and people in this room are working on this, it is the, the, the single contact point information system where we will be able to get the information. Um, the excuse used to be we haven't got the IT systems to do this or be betraying confidentiality about these children. The IT systems are sophisticated now. We can collect this information. We can add to it. Um, so I think the next five years should see this turn around. Well, thank you. Uh, I hope you'll agree what a fantastic start to, uh, to this conference. Uh, really compelling presentations there, insightful and informative.